Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and the concluding part of our artillery week. Although I can tell you we will be returning to this subject in the future because it has been very popular. Anyway, joining me today is Dan Gazeta, author of Toxic, A History of Nerve Agents. And he was on previously a couple of years ago, right in the early days, talking about chemical warfare in that regard. And he's an ex renowned expert on that. But he's here to talk about uh, chemical mortars and how they fit into the artillery branch or whether they fit into the artillery branch. But uh, good evening, Dan. How are you today? Oh, I'm I'm I've had a long week, but I'm glad to be here. It's, uh, you know, I just say to the uh, followers, you can put my name into Google. You'll see the week I've had. But this is an absolute blessed relief to come and talk about actual military history instead of the BS I've been dealing with. So there we yeah. go. Well, thank you very much for taking time out and what has been a busy week. So the recurring theme with Tank Destroyer Week and Artillery Week, the recurring question is there is a definition of uh, what apply, what is artillery, but then when you get into the practice of a real war, the what is and isn't artillery becomes very flexible. And that brings us to chemical mortars know, because... Yeah. You know, we'll talk about definitions and language as the show goes on, but you know, they are definitely used in an artillery role. But are mm. they artillery? Well, we'll we, we will discuss it. But you've come with a PowerPoint, and folks yeah. will do questions as as we go along today. So, Dan, I'm okay. gonna hand it straight over to you, and let's talk about chemical mortars uh, and, right. and the battalions that use them. All right, I'm going to talk about the U.S. Army chemical mortars and chemical mortar battalions in the Second World War. Um, there'll be a, there could be a little bit of a coda about the Korean War at the end because it's it's probably relevant, and there's going to be a little bit of a drive-by shooting of the U.S. Navy in here, by the way, uh, just because I can. Um, let's uh, well, just by means of introduction, uh, my current role is I'm an associate fellow at the Royal United Services Institute, the oldest and best think tank in the entire universe, and I am speaking not on their behalf in my own personal capacity here. So go on to the next slide here. Okay, when somebody asks, what is a chemical mortar? Well, in terms of the U.S. military and the U.S. Army, the Second World War, it refers to basically one thing, and you're looking at it there. It's the M2 4.2-inch mortar. And I'll talk a little bit about why it's a chemical mortar. Okay, so let's talk about the First World War. The First World War ended with chemical weapons being a little bit of a, a disappointment. Chemical weapons were used rather disappointingly in that, disappointing to their promoters in that they didn't actually win or lose many battles. Uh, I mean, most countries sort of had an argument after the war. Is it really worth dealing with chemical weapons or not? Um, but this particular device that you're looking at there, the chemical mortar, and we're mostly going to not talk about chemical stuff, was originally developed to employ chemical weapons. Yeah. Uh, the idea being in the U.S. Army that actually the field artillery branch, and we can talk about where artillery ends and begins and where chemical mortars begin and end, the, the small but growing U.S. Army Chemical Warfare Service, which then became my regiment, the Chemical Corps, uh, had its origin in 1917. Uh, by the end of the war, it had, it had these ideas about you know new weapons and new systems and all that, uh, and decided that it really needed uh, you know better devices for you know sending using chemical weapons. Now the U.S. The U.S. Army is well out of this business now, but we're talking about 1918, 1920, things like that. So the Regimental rivalry being what it was, the Chemical Warfare Service always figured that chemical weapons were going to be a bastard stepchild in the field artillery branch. They would never practice with them enough. They would never work out the firing tables terribly well. So if we're going to have chemical warfare, us, you know, the chemical corps, we're going to have to do it ourselves. Right. So what happened was the development of what you see right there, the 4.2 inch, and which is uh, 107 millimeters in new money, uh, mortar. And now I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to go on to the next slide so we can talk a little bit more about what this thing looks like, okay? Uh, and you'll you'll see from scale scale photos how big the thing is. So we're talking about, you know, again, most of these figures are in. Um, you know, pounds because the old the old field manuals which i have copies of if anybody really wants them because i collect this shit um 
Nothing on my field manuals, Dan. I used to have a shed full of them. Uh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. So, so here's here's what the thing looks like. It's um, the whole thing weighs three hundred something pounds, which in the mortar world is pretty big, but not the biggest thing out there. Okay. Now the important thing is it comes apart into three parts. It comes apart into the what they call the standard, which is literally the stand, the the the, the bit on the left that holds the thing up. Uh, the, bar uh, the the barrel assembly, which is 105 pounds, and the base plate, which is 175 pounds. If you take that thing apart, I mean, it's heavy, but it's not so heavy that a couple of burly guys can't move it around. All right. Now that'll come in, uh, and we're going to explain why that matters in a little bit because I'm trying. To, I'm going to try to sort of tie this all together. Okay. Now, because it's a mortar. All you got to do to fire stuff is to pick up a shell and drop it in the top end and it goes boop and it fires. You can actually get a very high rate of fire out of this thing. And this is going to be important too. Well, all this could be important. I'm going to tie this all together. So once you set the thing up and you can see there's not a lot of setup to this thing. It's it's um, stick the base plate down, put the standard up, stuck the barrel on, you know, make a few adjustments, look in the sight, and bang, Bob's your uncle, you're ready to go. A good crew can get this thing ready to go in less than two minutes. Uh, and your first two minutes, provided that you have the ammunition all ready to go, you can throw 40 rounds out in two minutes. That's pretty good. Uh, you know, the crew will get tired, and it's not so much the crew getting tired. Uh, it'll start to heat up. And then over your first 20 minutes, you can do about 100 rounds. Um, again, when we start comparing this to the more traditional artillery, yeah, that's, um, that's, uh, that's pretty good. And prolonged fire over a long period of time, 60 rounds an hour, one round a minute. Now, this is not a long range weapon. Uh, maximum range, 4,400 yards, minimum range, uh, 565 yards. Uh, it, and again, why was it designed this way? Because to use effectively the chemical weapons of the First World War, you needed to have a pretty high saturation quickly in a very defined area of, uh, of operations for really to you to, to do effective casualty production among the enemy, or if you were using mustard as a, because mustard gas, which isn't a gas, it's an oily liquid. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's an area denial weapon more than a casualty producer, but mm -hmm. you need actually, if you work out how many, you know, kilograms you need per, per, per acre to actually use it as a area denial weapon, you got to put a lot of stuff out in a lot, uh, period of time. So this is, this is a thing designed to put a lot of material out downrange very quickly. Yeah, awesome. And that accuracy, is that why this oh, has the rifle barrel? The rifle because... barrel. Yeah, most, you see, most, 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 uh, most mortars are smooth board. This thing has a rifle barrel. Now, I don't, I'm not going to presume to insult the intelligence of the World War II television readers about what rifle is, but I, I'll just say it's got a rifle barrel just like, well, a rifle. Uh, this, all, this has several things. First of all, it's actually extremely accurate because the rifle barrel imparts a spin on the round. Second, it doesn't need those funny fins in the. I'm going to show you what the ammunition look like. It doesn't need the fins on the bottom of the uh, of the mortar rounds. So that means the ammunition proportionate for its size is actually uh, lighter uh, because you're not cutting yourself up because those fins are actually quite sharp in some cases. Uh, you can actually manhandle this stuff faster than the, than the rounds with all the fins on it. And you got to be careful with the more rounds with the fins on it because if you bend one of those fins, the thing's going to go wonky. Yeah. Uh, these mortar shells don't have any fins on them. Okay. So, so we just got a question already from Ian watching. How would a rifle barrel work for loading? Do you have to to drop the the the, ra the bomb in in a particular way, or will it no, no, it's it's straight down and straight back out? There, you know, it 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 yeah, yeah, it just sort of worked. You know. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. Uh, it becomes an issue. Why aren't the other ones out there rifled? And that's a question I don't know. I can't answer that. Can we go on to the next slide? And I'll show you a few things here. Okay. Um, and the family tree of this thing came from something called the four-inch Stokes mortar, which was a British mortar. Uh, the three-inch Stokes mortar, which works out to 76 millimeters, I think. Uh, and then there was the four-inch, which works out to slightly less than... Um, uh, uh, Somewhere around, uh, I don't know, 105 or something, uh, 100, 100 millimeters, 100. 
yeah, something like that. Phoenix Hunger 102 off the top of my head, but yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the uh, so uh, the Stokes was a pretty effective mortar as far as sort of size, uh, its ability to uh, deploy chemical weapons. So uh, effectively, it's 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 the spiritual godfather, godmother, whatever you want to call it. You know, you know, uh, of 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 the 4.2 inch mortar. I should say from this point on, I'm going to use the I'm going to use the nickname. This thing was called the Four Deuce. Yeah, everybody called it the Four Deuce, and it had later versions that were used for for, for things also called the Four Deuce. Um, and so the Four Deuce, it came out of this family tree of a British system. All right, and so let's go to the next slide here, and I'm going to show you a couple things. All right, there's some pictures of what the ammunition looks like, and notice. There is no long prongy bit at the bottom, no fins, just a little propellant block. All right. Uh, and there you have it. Okay. Now, I'm going to, because if you actually look for it, if anybody wants to take notes, you can take down that chemical warfare uh, supply catalog, uh, you know, uh, number. That, that document is available online. You can, you can get all geeked out on that if you want and download that. Um, and so, I'm going to start from the bottom and work up because this thing was this thing was originally developed for chemical warfare. So it had these shells for mustard gas, which again is not a gas. HD is is distilled mustard. HT is thickened mustard. You see that at the bottom. Uh, and because the U.S. Army chemical troops also had the mission of wide area smoke, it very quickly developed a, a, a mission. We're talking now 1920s, 1930s. You know. These chemical mortar battalions, of which at the time there were only two, uh, had this mission of also doing wide area smoke. Okay, so very quickly there was a white phosphorus shell. Okay, uh, and again, the same principle applied. If you want smoke, uh, having a half arced, small, thin smoke screen is not terribly useful. If you want smoke, you want it now, you want it big, you want a basically impenetrable, visible barrier. So you want to have a lot of smoke shells very quickly on a particular you know you know line or, or you know generally a line but you know a, you know, a, a grid square or something like that you want smoke you want it fast so the same logic applied for the white phosphorus shells all right and the high explosive shell didn't actually come into things until actually when the second world war always started and i'll talk a little about that in a sec um, okay we have a couple of questions already before yeah. because they're, they're they're a knowledgeable bunch so Trevor yeah. Sheen, is it, was there an illuminating round no, there was later. Oh, we're talking, we're talking, this is World War II TV. There are all kinds of other, other crap later. There was a CS tear gas round. There was an illuminating round. Uh, there was uh, a non-WP smoke rounds uh, 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 that kind of came in at the very end of the Second World War using zinc chloride. Uh, you, can, you, you, can, you can find other stuff, but when we're, actually, when we're actually looking at the Second World War, these were the options available. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna point out something Just to you. Two more questions, then we're gonna okay. then I'll hand it back to you because okay. people are being very um very um inquisitive. So Chilo is asking, can you vary the propellant charge as in conventional mortar rounds? No, it's you you vary the range by you know, the angle of the weapon. That's why there's there's not a huge difference between the minimum range and the maximum range, sort of 500 meters to you know 4,000 something meters. Okay. You know it's it's a and, and the propellant comes with it, and that's it. And then there you go. So, okay. but that is also one of the reasons why they have a high rate of fire. You don't have to be fiddling around adjusting uh, propellant charges. Okay. And then the last question, then we have well, for this batch. Peter O'Connell is asking, in a high risk, high ex uh, high explosive environment, firing from four thousand meters, where do you store your non WP chemical rounds? Oh, uh, mostly. Um, Hundreds of miles in the rear because they didn't actually get in, except in very rare situations, they were not deployed very forward. They right. were kept in depots well in the rear just in case. Okay, so uh, as an issue, that didn't really actually come up very much in, in the Second World War. Okay, thanks. Well, right. back to you then. Okay, now I'm gonna I'm gonna point out something to you. Um, a 24 pound shell is something a guy can carry. You know. Uh, and a sort of, if you think of a, a bucket brigade of guys, you know, can pass 24 pound shells up, 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 a, up a slope to the top of a hill. Okay. Uh, guys are not going to do that with 155 millimeter artillery rounds, or at least not for very long. So, 
And we're going to get into the weight of these shells and why that matters too. Okay. I also got to say, look at the muzzle velocity. Now you probably got some, I know, I, I know we got a muscle velocity geek on there. Uh, these are actually quite slow muscle velocity, uh, muscle, muzzle velocities. This isn't going to give you the boom or the crack of a, of a, of a howitzer around. Uh, this thing had the, had the notorious reputation of being just a loud bloop and then basically practically silent in the air and then out of nowhere, bang. Okay. Uh, so those are quite slow muzzle velocities. All right. I mean, just to give an idea, a panther is about 3,000 feet per second, a panther shell leaving. Yeah, yeah. These uh, are, these are sub four times more velocity ish. Yeah, yeah. This is subsonic. This is subsonic. Um, and so it's not giving, it's not giving a uh, sonic boom or crack with it. Right. Uh, so that that becomes relevant. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Now, this is all going to come together, and I'm, so this so, comes together. I I want to give a shout out to this guy in the photo here. Uh, this guy is a personal hero of mine. He's with the 99th Chemical Mortar Battalion. He is Private First Class Joe Spatola, uh, demonstrating what we would say is the proper attitude towards Nazis. You know, he yeah yeah he just gave he just gave him hell. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk through this. The, why all of a sudden somebody somewhere twigged this mortar puts out a lot of rounds very quickly. What if we just gave them high explosive rounds? Because you know, you know it's great having a battalion in case we need a smoke screen, but you know, a lot of times we don't need a smoke screen, but there's these mortars. Let's give them something that uh, goes bang. Yeah. Uh okay, all right, fine, let's do that. Yeah, you know, so the US Army spent much of 1942, early 1943 working that out and fielding it. And so all of a sudden, instead of being a, an asset that was kept more or less in the rear in case there was gonna be chemical warfare, all of a sudden this chem these chemical yeah, mortar battalions, oh let's see, they can do some they can do some damage. All right. So let's start start with a high rate of fire. You remember that rate of fire we had? Uh, the rate of fire on this particular system is much higher than, than its competitors. Its competitors would be the 105 millimeter howitzer and the 155 millimeter howitzer. Generally, the allocation would be about three battalions of 105 millimeter howitzers for an infantry division and a battalion of the heavier, slower 155 millimeter, plus additional, additional artillery battalions at, at core and army level. Uh, but in practice, this particular system could throw out a lot more you know, steel on target, you know, you know, lead downrange, whatever your, whatever your, whatever your, your, your gunnery uh, your aphorism is. Uh, it, you could do a hell of a lot per minute, per hour, you know, whatever your metric is, you could put a lot more out. Okay. Now, the other thing is the system overall is much lighter than a 105 millimeter howitzer the whole thing weighs less than a quarter of what a 105 millimeter howitzer i didn't even bother to look up the comparison uh the high explosive payload however is more than a 105 millimeter howitzer by about mm -hmm. it's about 50 percent higher in terms of actual high explosive yield and the overall projectiles are lighter okay Again, they're not they're not jammed up with a lot of thick casing, and they're not jammed up with a lot of uh, extra propellant. Because you know, the, uh, okay, so this will bear into things like transportation and logistics and stuff later on. Now, I hopefully will tie this all together uh, because it's overall the system is lighter uh, because it is theoretically man portable. Although there wasn't a lot of yeah you know, yeah you know, guys you know, you know, really you know road marching this thing for for, for miles, uh, but it is more mobility. And you could take it to places that you literally just cannot put a howitzer. So you could take it up to the top of the hill. You could get this thing up to the top of a rooftop of a building. You could do that sort of thing with it. Because, again, you take it apart and the heaviest component is the base plate, which is like 175 pounds. Now, I'm too old and broke down to schlep 175 pounds of a base plate up to the roof of a building. But four burly army privates from 1943, get on it. Okay, less setup time. A good crew could get this thing up and going uh in a couple minutes maximum okay that gets really valuable with things like say landing on a beach yeah the the absolute setup time on the field artillery on the on the proper howitzers five six eight ten times as much there's a lot of fiddling and farting around and setting that howitzer up okay uh 
And I will talk a little bit more about the next point, the Fire Direction Center. These are the guys that say you know, that, that that do all the calculations with the slide rules and charts and tables to figure out the actual firing instructions for the thing. That stuff was actually very good and better staffed in a chemical mortar battalion than it was in the field artillery battalion. I'll, I'll explain why in a later. Uh, and, and that's the next point. The, uh, because everybody involved in this was not an artilleryman. These guys were soldiers of the U.S. Army Chemical Warfare Service. These are guys who spent a lot of time working out how to read the weather. They had good weather instrumentation. Mm. Uh, they were good at calculations. So the fire direction centers were actually very good. Instead of one battalion fire direction center, each company had its own separate company level fire direction center. Again, back to rifled barrel. I can't stress the rifled barrel enough. Uh, that rifled barrel meant if you did the calculations right, you were going to get extremely accurate fire on this. And this is interesting, Dan, because when Rob was on last night talking about mm -hmm. artillery, mm -hmm. with all the variables that affect, you know, artillery fire being accurate, is that time is being lost. You know, you direct that, the forward observer directs that fire in, and yeah. it might take another minute or two to correct that fire or longer. And, oh, yeah. and as with as with tank battles in Normandy, as I'm always banging yeah. on about, it doesn't often come down to who has the biggest gun or who has the best. It's about who shoots first. Okay, and, and who and shoots also, first is so important, isn't it? Okay, and, and let me let me let me explain. It's just I think it's probably relevant right now. Then I'll just speak to it from the point right now. The U.S. Army Chemical Warfare Service at this point is staffed. The 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 guys who are who are the company and battalion level officers of this corps of this branch of the army are mostly draftees they are chemists and chemical engineers they've been drafted in and stuck in the chemical warfare service because that's where the selective service system stuck them okay these are guys with degrees who know how to crunch numbers all right uh and you set them you set them in a room somewhere in edgewood maryland because that's what the school was uh, and you give them lots of charts and slide rules and specialty tables. And this is a point which these guys all went through degrees, whether it's chemistry degrees or chemical engineering degrees, where they had to do charts and tables and slide rules and all that uh, and do a lot of math very quickly to pass their exams. All right. So you inadvertently, because you wanted guys good at predicting how to use chemical warfare and also predicting the enemy's uh, how bad the enemy attack is going to be and all that. All that skill set is transferable to fire direction center stuff, okay? Uh, and the, the, the table organization for one of these battalions honestly has got more mathematical prowess shoved into it than a field artillery battalion does, okay? So there's stuff at company level that was just not at battery level in the field artillery, okay? And there's stuff at battalion level that was just, you know, not available in, except by dumb luck because of however the personnel system worked. So you had a brain trust in every one of these battalions on how to basically crunch the numbers. And because you're talking about a short range system, okay, 4,000 meters, you're not well back from the front firing, firing in the blind at hypothetical targets. Half the time you could stand on the roof of whatever hut you were, your fire direction center is with a bunch of binoculars and and much more rapidly relay corrections down to the guy literally down in the down in the down in the down in the building before you. The typical fire direction center was set up in a farmhouse. OK, and so somebody could crawl up on the roof with the binoculars and the M2 artillery compass and yell down corrections to the fire direction center. That would have taken 30 to 90 seconds being you know, relayed over wire or yeah. bad radio or whatever. So the whole turnaround and everything was much faster. So it all boiled down to, you know, the whole system was inadvertently structured so that you could get a lot of a lot of high explosive on the target much more quickly with a chemical mortar battalion than you could with 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 a uh with a conventional artillery baton. And that leads to my next point. These mortar battalions had more systems in them. A chemical mortar battalion uh, started out with 48 mortars, okay? Uh, and by the, it was sort of what they would call the, the square system would have four companies. By the end of the war, by, by the time you get into the four, late 43, 44, there was what they called triangular battalions. So there were three mortar companies, uh, you know, but you know, this was compared to 12 to 16 tubes in a field artillery battalion. So, you know, the package was more, there was more stuff in the package. Okay. And so if you had, I mean, if you had, 
if you were an infantry regiment and you had a chemical mortar company attached to you, you know, you had 12 chemical mortars. If you had a 105 millimeter, you know, artillery battery attached to you, which often happened to, you would have 405 millimeter tubes, okay? Maybe six, depending on the TOE, um, and in a firing battery. So just the the way the stuff came in the package, and, you know, the Army is all about prepackaged stuff. The, mm. pack, the fire support package you would get from a chemical mortar battalion just equated to a hell of a lot more death and destruction, mind you, at much slower range. If you were trying to reach out 15 kilometers, you needed something like a 155. All right, next slide, please. All right, like I said, uh, mobility. The whole thing could be manhandled up a dirt track on a trolley. Okay, there's an example. Both of these, I think, are from the second, the second chemical mortar battalion, which is the oldest of the chemical mortar battalions. There was never a first, but you know, unit numbering in the U.S. Army yeah. is, makes no sense. Uh, and again, there is the same unit on the right gra dragging that stuff up. Up a hill. Both of these are from the Sicily campaign, and I'll I'll explain why Sicily is important. Now, mobility here. I mean, one of the things about the mobility here, uh, because the whole system only weighed three hundred something pounds, the prime mover could be a jeep. Not you didn't need a three quarter ton truck. You didn't need a deuce and a half truck. You did. You needed. A, you could. You could. You could use a smaller vehicle to move this thing. So by the end of the war. The basic allocation is one mortar, one Jeep, have at it, you know, stick the thing on the trailer. The trailer's always getting lost or broken, but, you know, uh, it was movable by Jeep. So, therefore, it was movable in a lot more places than the, the 105 millimeter it was. Uh, it was about as portable as a 75 millimeter pack houser, but the 75 millimeter pack houser, pack houser basically had a shell the size of this glass of water. It was kind of pointless. Um, so you could take, you literally could take this up into up, up the hill, down the hill. You could cross over the river on it. You could put this thing on a raft. You know, you could put it on one of those inflatable, you know, RB12 rafts and get it across. You couldn't do that. You can't do that with a house. You just can't do it. So you could, you could get this thing to a lot of places. Next slide. Okay. This all boils down to logistics. Okay. So. If you look, you know, you you look you look at what does a what does a 105 millimeter high explosive shell boil it onto, in in the war, 19 kilograms, okay, uh, and mind you that comes with a actual bang, you know, a explosive component that is sort of 30 or 40 percent less than the 4.2 the four deuce. Second, yeah, yeah, the other competitor, the 155 millimeter shell, which does give you a bigger bang, goes a lot more destruction, goes a lot further away. But that thing is, you know, naked, it's 43 kilograms, and then has up to, depending it, because there's various propellant bags you can stick with it and all that, up to six kilograms of propellant, as opposed to the 4.2-inch round, which is indoor, outdoor, it comes with a propellant, all that. So that means when you work out the logistic tail, you can move more rounds with a truck than, you know, than you, you can for an artillery battalion, okay? Uh, rounds that can be hand-carried in a pinch. Because the prime mover is a jeep, not a truck. There's also less fuel and less maintenance. Uh, a, a a leaner spare part, uh, uh, a leaner spare part uh, yeah, supply chain. All this all this glorious stuff that I used to have to worry about when I, my inglorious year as a battalion logistics officer back in my back in my misguided youth. All this stuff is all the logistics for the entire chemical mortar battalion. Uh, you know is uh you know is 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 leaner okay mm. now i see somebody ask what's the minimum range the minimum ra i see somebody in the chat there because i am looking at the chat the minimum range is about 550 yards all right you could probably you could probably bootleg that even more by i don't know sticking a couple of phone books under the base plate or something but you know with the base plate level you know the thing as high up as it go it's about 550 50 uh 50 yards okay all right and so the other question we've got, I'm sure you're going to cover this, is that yeah. at what level would a chemical mortar company be assigned to a line unit at company battalion level or brigade? Getting there. I thought I'll you were. Get, oh, getting there. And, and, I'm, and I know you're going to cover this as well. I mean, because you've, you've stressed that these personnel have been, you know, they are from the chemical units. That's what yeah. they are. Yeah. 
even as they start using more and more HE and being used essentially as a regular mortar, there's no question of changing their name to something else. They just remain chemical mortars and that's it, yeah? Well, yeah, uh, because up until the very end of the war, their primary mission actually is to be the chemical warfare employing element of the U.S. Army. Okay. Okay, because by this point, the field artillery has done no training whatsoever on using their chemical artillery rounds. And these guys went through a whole training profile and all that. So if it was necessary to use phosgene or, or mustard in the European or Pacific theater, these were the guys who were going to do okay, it. Okay, so, so that, that's their primary purpose, yeah. even yeah. though we now know it wasn't utilized. You can see yes. it's like it's like a firefighter who puts out fires, but actually spends most of his time getting kittens down from trees. He's still a firefighter yes. first. Okay, right. Yes. Yeah. And not only that, these guys had additional tasks like decontamination and impregnating clothing and stuff like that. Because some of these units had like a depot company associated with them where if it really happened, some of these guys were going to have to go and basically run a field laundry to turn, you know, uh, army fatigues into chemical weapons protective kit. Yeah. Believe it or not. Yeah. So there, all the, there's an excellent book, which I will show you at the end. It's available as a free download for the Center for Military History from the U.S. Army. It explains all this stuff because right. everybody's worried about Hitler or the Japanese, you know, re, re, uh, switching over to this stuff, to the chemical stuff at any moment. Because mind you, the Japanese are actually using chemical weapons against the Chinese. So it's not like chemical warfare wasn't being used in the war. Okay, it was being used in that bit of the war. We didn't have any, any guys on the ground in, but that's a different story. All right, next next slide. Okay, what did a chemical mortar battalion look like? Um, a battalion headquarters, three or four mortar companies, usually started with four. By the end of the war, it was three. Sort of in 1942, 1943, a lot of the chemical mortar battalions uh, coughed up their fourth company, so they used that to scrape up to make more mortar battalions. Uh, each mortar company had a fire direction center and three mortar platoons. Uh, the mortar platoons each had a squad. Each squad had a mortar and a jeep. Um, this works out to 36 to 48 mortars per battalion, as opposed to 12 to 16 for the conventional artillery. Uh, the table organization, uh, 37 officers, 138 NCOs, and 481 junior enlisted men as a uh, as 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 the authorization again, we know how it is with tables of organization. Hardly anybody ever maintained that through the war, but that's how they would start out when they were being built up in training. Okay, so look at that ratio. You compare that to an artillery battalion. That's more officers and more NCOs. Okay, mm -hmm. this is slightly top heavy, but that's because there's one of these fire. There's there there, there are guys whose only job in the war is to hide hide in the back of a hide under a poncho in the back of a Jeep somewhere, working their slide rules. Okay. Uh, and so there is more expertise, you know, there's more brain wattage, you know, you yeah, know, front loaded yeah. into one of these chemical mortar battalions than you would get normally. Okay. Uh, next slide. Now, this is how these things were used. Uh, chemical mortar battalions didn't belong to any division. This is, you know, this is why they always feel a bit left out because the big reunions in the U.S. Army for the were always the 101st, the 82nd, the 1st Infantry Division, the 2nd Division. All that. These were not divisional assets. They were freestanding battalions, and they would float around at corps and army level. Okay, uh, they generally weren't organized into higher level brigades or anything like that. They were independent units at corps level. All right, and the Typical, the typical practice was to uh, attach a chemical mortar battalion to a line division. And therefore, you could parcel, uh, you could parcel out a chemical mortar company to each of the, uh, each of the three line regiments. And that, were, that became the relatively normal thing. It would be rare for a chemical mortar battalion to be fully massed and operate all up at once. It would occasionally happen. But, you know, once, once the Army got habit of using these things, it, it was basically a, Chop, chop the uh, chop the the battalion up into its three mortar companies. Spread them around. The battalion was basically relegated. The battalion headquarters and the support troops were basically the supply chain to keep the shells running because they had the ammunition sections and the maintenance and all that. So they would they would be the supply chain to keep that independent company supplied with shells. They were passed around like crazy. It was it was really like a, these things were passed around in these campaigns. Like a, like a like a dubie at Glastonbury. I mean, mm. so, uh, because they were extremely popular with the commanders. So what often happened is these guys stayed in combat longer than the line units they were supporting. 
there's a lot of there's a lot of instances of chemical mortar companies and battalions having to stay on the line when the division that they were supporting had taken off. These guys were still in the fight. Just a new new infantry regiment comes up. So they did a lot of hard duty. I'll throw some stats at you later. Okay, as I said before, uh, because they were very close to the front line because of the minimum maximum range, they got a reputation for being actually very responsive to uh, requests for fire from battalion and regiment sort of you know, actions. Okay, often and usually, in fact, quicker than the uh, than the associated 105 and 155 millimeter artillery. And it was a more streamlined operation. I mean, it was literally run a telephone wire to whatever hut that they, the fire direction center was in. And, you know, it, you know there you go. Uh, there were more layers of bureaucracy in the call for fire from divisional and core level artillery. I mean, this, you can you can find one of these field manuals on fire support planning. Uh, I, I don't recommend it unless you're suffering from, you know, <laughs> depression or insomnia or something, you know, it make you, well, no, if you're suffering from depression, do not read one of these fire support coordination field manuals. You will lose the will to live. Um, I read this stuff so you don't have to. Right. Okay. So, so what you get, there we go. So you know, operationally, uh, here's the thing. These guys could go ashore on a beach in a way that, you know, an artillery c couldn't quite do it. You know, trying to set up a 155 millimeter howitzer on the beach, it's going to sink in and you're not going to get an accurate survey on it. You're not going to get, you know, uh, guess what? With that big fat base plate, depending on the sand, uh, most beaches, you can set the thing up on the sand. All right. Uh, I already made this extra this extra uh, this extra point already about at the chemical school with the emphasis on math and weather effects. It meant, they, meant their fire direction stuff was. Uh, sometimes heroically, absurdly accurate. All mm -hmm. right. Uh, also, the traditional advantage of mortars is high angle fire. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is very, very useful on the beaches because you've got a lot of low angle fire from your naval gunfire support, which in naval gunfire, if you, I should have made a diagram, in naval gunfire is extremely accurate left and right. But the slightest difference top up and down, you know, you know um, yeah, you, you, know, uh, you know, one degree difference, and that shell is missing everything and going way inland and blowing up some farmer's chickens. Uh, whereas the high angle fire is sort of the opposite, you know. Uh, and again, operationally, these were much quieter than howitzers. Oftentimes, the Germans, the first time they knew where they were getting shells when that first shell went off, whereas there was a big boom and a crack, you'd hear that. Mm -hmm. You want to hear that with a four deuce. Okay. It was a silent killer. All right. All right, next slide. All right, and I have to give a shout out to the Navy. Our friends in the U.S. Navy observed this. Uh, they observed. They observed. In fact, they observed it from the very beginning because the uh, they observed this as chemical mortar battalions set up literally on the beach in Sicily uh, uh, during Operation Husky, and then during the invasion. Uh, th then during then then the uh, then the invasion of Salerno, then Normandy. Uh, you know what? This is not bad for like, uh, let's fix this uh, naval gunfire thing. Let's give a little bit of high angle stuff. So there were, the Navy developed, I think about six of these things, the LCI parentheses M, landing craft infantry parentheses mortar. I think there were about six of them and they had each had three, uh, they had three uh, of these 40s mortars. Uh, and, you know, Navy guys went off and trained at, uh, at Edgewood, Maryland, at, at the Army uh, Chemical School on how to employ them and all that. So I've got to give some respect to the Navy. These things did hard, hard service uh, in the Pacific theater. I don't, I don't think any of these served in the, in, in the, uh, in the European theater. Okay. Next. okay. When the war started, there were only two battalions in the service at the beginning of the end of 1942. There was a... I almost got to say there was a third battalion. There was, but it was the Filipino Army, and it got captured and didn't really. It didn't have any high explosive rounds, uh, uh, so it didn't wasn't able to do much in the war and ended up getting you know, getting destroyed in the Philippine campaign. Uh, so there were two battalions, the second and the third. Uh, about six more battalions were worked up uh, and developed in 1942, but then. We had this, yeah, they arrived in the Mediterranean theater too late for the North Africa campaign. They, you know, they, they were in the rear areas. They didn't have high explosive rounds and all the, but then the high explosive rounds arrived. Units trained up for them and operational debut was Husky, the invasion of Sicily. Uh, an amazing 35,000 rounds fired in 38 days. General Marshall, who was taking very close notes on this whole thing, 
terribly impressed. He worked up this whole thing. We need more chemical mortar battalions. We need a chemical mortar battalion for every division. And that's what's going to happen. So he basically ordered up more mortar battalions. And so there was this frenzy from 1943 up until, you know, basically the end of the war to shove more guys through the training pipeline and to get these chemical mortar battalions out there. Uh, and so that's, and what you have is then from, from, from summer of 1943, when operation Husky happened off until basically the absolute end of the war, uh, everywhere the U S army was, there was chemical mortar battalions. I'm not, and I'm going to apologize right now. I'm not going to draw too much on the campaign history of it. Yeah. Where did they go? Where did it, uh, because the answer is they went everywhere. Yeah. There's a chemical, there, there's a chemical mortar battalion that went everywhere. Okay. Uh, there were seven that served in the Pacific theater, 18 in the European and Mediterranean theater. Okay. And some of these units got quite spread out because like I said, mo- all of these had either four or three battalion, uh, three um, uh, companies under them. Uh, they would spread out in a lot of places, shifted around from the major operations. Uh, there is not a there is not a there is not a campaign in Europe, uh, Sicily onward that didn't have them. Uh, less so in the Pacific. It really depends. I mean, a lot of the Pacific fighting was the Marine Corps who didn't have it didn't have chemical mortar battalions. But you started getting them a lot in things like where the army starts getting heavy, like the New Guinea campaign and uh, and and the Philippines. I need to swat up more on the chemical mortars in the Pacific War because I'm I'm not that smart on it. Uh, but more importantly, they were going to have to play a huge role in Operation Olympic. And for those of you who don't know what Operation Olympic was, that was the planned invasion of the Japanese mainland. Yeah. Okay. And so every battalion you see there, the ones that weren't in the Pacific were en route to the Pacific at the end of the war. And there were seven more battalions that were formed in uh, sort of June and July of 1945. They're being trained up. And they were going to go into that massive meat grinder that was going to be Operation Olympic. But the, uh, uh, you know, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, meant that that didn't need to happen. Uh, Quick question I, for you from, uh, yeah. I think it's worth addressing. It's a really good one from Peter again. Given the flexible deployment of the chemical mortar troops and their proximity to the front lines, did they have their own infantry support or rely on the units they've been assigned to support them? They, they, got re- they, had, to rely on, they had to rely on the units that, supported, uh, that they were supporting. Uh, that didn't always work. Uh, some of these units had to get into basically really, really bad scrapes, particularly you get into the, uh, you get into the battle of the bulge, for example, some of these chemical mortar guys were, uh, you know, basically they were uh, the joke with uh, the chemical infantry, uh, the chemical infantry. And so these guys were, these guys were, these guys were literally like, uh, you know, shooting the, shooting their M1 carbines over the top of the, uh, over the top of the trench. And firing a few rounds and shooting a few more rounds at the Germans, so it didn't always work. But it, the the idea was that whatever unit was supporting them would have to give them the whatever unit they were attached to was going to have to give them the, the major support. Okay. Another quick question from Trevor, who who was wonderful on our channel talking about the Tunisia campaign. Was there a British or German equivalent of the chemical mortar battalions? Not really. No, I mean there were there were there were approximate technical equivalents of. The system, okay, but there was not an organizational equivalent of this, you know, battalion-sized force structure, okay, to do it. You know, I, I, it's it's a unique thing. It was, you know, it's a, a funny aberration of war, and it happened. Uh, I can't find an equivalent. Um, okay, next thanks. slide. I, I'm going to talk a little about. I'm going to take a slice here of history just to give you an example. I'm going to look at a couple of units. Uh, there is a very good website where you can look at the unit histories of all these, and that's going to be on my last slide. Uh, the second chemical battalion, it was one of the ones that was pre-existing at the time. All right. It went to North Africa in June of 1943, which is after pretty much the whole North Africa campaign was pretty much over. Went to Sicily in July. I mean, literally like 18 days later. And mainland of Italy in September. Uh, uh, France you know, went in on... Uh, was it Operation Varsity? Was that what they called the invasion, or was it Anvil? Whatever, whatever. Anvil, Anvil was the one. The, the invasion yeah. of south, the southern France. So it went. It didn't go on D-Day. It went in on the, on the southern uh, invasion. But you look at this. So it took uh, 56 KIA. That should, I'm sorry, it's a misprint. It should be 201 wounded in action. It spent 511 days in combat. You compare this to infantry units who are rotated much more quickly. There's not many infantry units that were 511 days in combat. There are some. Uh, And because of a very good battalion S4, there was a record of exactly how many rounds were fired. 
I got to love the U S army for this stuff that somebody has got the receipts. Uh, yeah. So you got 137,124 rounds. Now I didn't have a frame of reference to that. So I started looking up some of the hardcore field artillery units. So I found one of the hardest fighting field artillery units was the 320th field artillery. It was the, it was the glider. It was the glider howitzer guys who went in with the 82nd airborne. Right. Yeah. And they did hard duty. Okay. They fired only 68,562 rounds in the whole war. Okay. Wow. Uh, uh, and I found a, I, I found a very hard, hard luck uh, artillery battalion, the 258th field artillery. They were 155 millimeter. They only fired 33,902 rounds the whole war. Okay. So, uh, and I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to say there are, there, there, there's at least one of the chemical mortar battalions that shot a half million rounds. Okay. Uh, this, so this 137,000 is a little bit lightweight. The, uh, I think I want to say it was the 83rd chemical battalion. Uh, I think they were about half a million. They, they were, they were overachievers. Uh, next slide. I've got a question from Correcticus. Uh, okay. What was the main cause of killed in action? Was it counter battery fire? It was a little bit of everything. It was, it was counter, a counter battery fire was a thing. Um, snipers stay behind units, uh, general I mean, you, you can read the unit histories. It was a little bit of everything, I think. I, I don't okay. think it was any one thing. But uh, counter-battery fire was significant. Okay. Brilliant. Next one. All right. Here's an example. Here's the third chemical battalion. All right. You know, Sicily, you know, Na Naples and Rome, southern France, Rhineland, Ardennes, you know, central Europe, you know, uh, Pretty much nonstop. You look at the there's 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 no there's no break. There's a there's a little bit of a break between the, the Rome Arno campaign and then going into southern France, and that's it. So 447 days in combat. You know, 54 KIA, 174 wounded in action, 171,612 rounds fired. So, but here here go to the next slide. This is really going to show you that that the, this is all of the units that it was attached to. Yeah, I mean, when you sent me the PDF, that was that was amazing. Yeah. I mean, they are literally yeah. they're, they're thrown yeah. around. Yeah. All the these time, these aren't guys they? were yeah. these guys were around the houses, and they weren't just attached to they weren't just attached to uh, weren't just attached to uh, American units. You can see they were attached to French units as well, too. You know, uh, the the fifth the, the fifth army in Italy was as multinational as you could possibly get. There was everything in the fifth army in Italy, by the way. Uh, so these guys were around the houses. I mean, that really, truly, truly all over the place. And so that gives you an idea. Next slide. This is this this is going to really show you. Uh, yeah, this is this this is uh, the record from the, the Third Chemical Mortar Battalion. Uh, you compare this to this is this is a unit. This is a battalion size unit. This this sort of uh, this sort of record uh, comparable to any of the battalions in the airborne units. Okay. Yeah. Honestly, these guys spent more time in the field than the airborne units. You know, uh, all due respect to the paratroopers, they would go in, go out. You know, these guys were at it all the damn time. Uh, you know, this is a this is a serious, serious record of valor for one of these units. OK, for a unit that was probably only about 400 guys strong on average during the war. All right. So that kind of says a lot and again now this comes from a, this comes from an excellent website i'm I can, I can only really say that i'm the tip of the spear on this uh there there's this website put together by a couple of enthusiasts most of whom are the sons of of, of, of four deuce veterans they 4.2.org uh and so i got a lot of the stats out there and in the turn they have called these stats out of uh, uh, official official army records uh but if you really want to dig into this 4.2.org is where you're going to go next slide uh, I think I'm drawing this to an end. Uh, yeah. You know, there was this excellent book there on the right, the uh, Chemical Warfare Service, Chemicals and Combat. And that's the link for it. It's a free PDF download, okay? It will tell you anything you ever wanted to know about the U.S. Army Chemical Corps in the war. Uh, and again, 4.2.org will tell you in lavish detail uh, ab about basically every one of these chemical mortar battalions. It has lots of photos, interesting unit histories, stats, all that stuff. Uh, I, I owe them a debt of gratitude for having compiled this and made my job significantly easier. Now, on that note, I'm going to just take some questions. Uh, I'm going I'm to preempt a question. Somebody said something about Bari. Uh, there was a, 
Bari, Italy was an incident where a uh, yeah, oh, yes, 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 yes. Now that's only tangentially related to the chemical wars. Uh, a Luftwaffe raid on the port of Bari at the point at which the port of Bari was in the Allied rear and in, in a supply port for the uh, Italian campaign. A Luftwaffe air raid hit the uh, hit a supply ship, the John Harvey, and, and it had mustard gas on it. Now, it didn't have mustard gas rounds for the 4.2 mortar. It had M47 aerial drop mustard gas rounds. And it caused a huge problem. It caused a lot of casualties and all that. I mean, huge amounts of stuff. Lots of it, lots of bad publicity for the Army. And the Army was paying off, you know, widows and orphans and uh, disability pensions for, for literally decades afterwards. And it's all, I mean, you really want, I'll come back and do the whole John Harvey Barry story one, because uh, that's an interesting story unto Definitely. itself. But somebody was going to ask about it. And there you go. Okay. So we have a couple more questions. Um, so Greg Domini is asking, uh, any idea of the ratio of what WP smoke rounds, the AG rounds fired by the average battalion? About 10 to 1. 10 to H, uh, HE 10 to about one. Uh, yeah, these guys were, I mean, part of the thing is everybody, everybody had WP rounds for, for, for smoke missions. Uh, infantrymen had WP hand grenades for smoke, for smoke. Uh, tanks had WP rounds for smoke. Uh, and, and honestly, operationally, the, these, these battalions were great for a smoke mission, but only if you had a really, really, really big one. Now, there's a couple instances where they, they uh, particularly a couple of river crossing operations where they uh, were famous for some large smoke operations. But again, uh, it would, you know, some of these units fired almost no WP rounds. Uh, and it was mostly mostly HE. Okay. And then um, the, the next one is, you know, you're talking about the fact their primary function was yeah. to deliver chemical weapons should they be needed. But how seriously are they taking into consideration of, of, of them being attacked? Because that's their other function. I remember one of the veterans I met, yeah. they're always talking about you know, practicing their decontamination, yeah. their, their procedures. So do they ever kind of switch off as it gets towards the end of the war? Is that still pro priority training just in case? Well, well, it kind of went, it kind of went through phases because as it got more towards the end of the war, there was this idea that there was, because Hitler and his propaganda oh, started talking about, you know, miracle weapon, Wunderwaffen, and things like that. So, is 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 Hitler going to throw something at the last minute? I mean, as we know now, in retrospect, Hitler was sitting on a stockpile of twelve thousand six hundred tons of the nerve agent Tabun, didn't use it for various reasons. That, you know, I think I described in our last podcast, whenever yeah. that was years ago. Uh, no, definitely. Yeah. So, well, I think. I mean, my question is really: is why hasn't someone done a really good narrative history about the chemical motor batons because you yeah, know, it's you know landing, it's... It's every operations it's connected to paratroopers it's connected to river crossings it's, yeah. it's got, it's got d-days it's got it, it it would be it would be fantastic maybe i maybe i need to stick that on a list of books i'm supposed to write because i got about three in the uh, pipeline here so <laughs> yeah all right yeah, maybe, it comes maybe when i write out other things to do i'll do that one I think it's it, it, the title doesn't is off putting. The chemical mortar batons does not yeah. convey yeah. the role they do. I think if people oh, exactly. are listed, exactly. there, there's a monument on the, in uh, on Omaha Beach that lists the unit. I think it's Omaha, it might be you that lists the units that come ashore. And yeah. chemical mortar batons is, is on one of those more. I don't think people reading that kind of get excited by that. I think they think that's something else. And and, and the way you've been describing them, which is, is a really quick interaction. Lots of uh, rounds on target, delivered quickly, delivered from a mobile, uh, an easy to move position. Yeah, that that's sexy. That that's that's well, got yeah, that's maybe got legs. To, maybe I need to get George Clooney with pitch a Netflix series. Yeah, definitely that'd be good. Yeah. Okay. Um, did, did any chemical mortars fire directly from half tracks, or were they always dismounted? They're dismounted. There was, there were, there was a, there was a experimental thing with half tracks uh but on, they only made a dozen or so of them. i i can't find any operational record on the half tracks now the 4.2 inch mortar did have a uh, you know a later existence and and was used in armored personnel carriers later on in the in the, in the vietnam war and the cold war in its right. post chemical core life you know okay. But that's you know what happened to the what happened to the what happened to the chemical core and the chemical mortar battalions. Well, they were all very valuable. Uh, they were a little bit valuable in the Korean War, and then the basically the infantry branch took all the 4.2 mortars and 
left the Chemical Corps guys without any mortars, and we haven't had any fun since. Okay. Well, Dan, it's been absolutely fantastic. We will leave it there, and we will think of a, of a, of a theme week to bring you back and talk about that incident at greater length, because that would be really good, or we could do something else as you fit. But hopefully it'll be at the uh, end of a, of a quieter week for you than the one you've had this week. Oh, uh, um, yes. Well, yes, and it's been an absolute joy. I've been waiting to do this for years. Yeah, you suggested years. too many ages ago, and we finally got this. So, folks, this this is it for this week, although tomorrow, of course, tomorrow evening, we've got a rare show because we're launching World War One TV with our surprise host, who you'll find out who that is tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. UK time. So thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks for your questions. Thanks, Dan. It's Paul right. World War Two TV saying I will see you all next time. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Toodle pip. <laughs>